webinar. Okay, it's me, Kapil Gautam, and Optimatrix by profession, and also the founder of Mirai Foundation. Today, I am here with you all for hosting the Today I Talks program by Mirai Foundation, and I feel uh, extremely privile privileged to welcome you all for the session. So, I guess we have waited a long time for the presentation. So, okay. Uh, before starting our webinar, I want to request all the attendees uh, to mute your uh, mute their microphone uh, through the audio option that is visible on your screen. And let me also inform you all that we will be conducting discussion session at the end of the webinar. So uh, you have uh, we have enable our chat, which you can see easily on your screen. If you have any question in between, please pop out there on chat box. Okay. Our topic for today's webinar is Keratoconus to 2020 Think Outside the Cone. And we have a delegate, uh, Dr. Arun Gulani. He is a uh, director and chief surgeon, Gulani uh, Vision Institute, and former chief of cornea and refractive surgery in University of Florida, Florida, USA. Uh, sir, I would like to welcome you uh, to, in our platform, sir. My pleasure again. Uh... Doctor, it's a real pleasure to be here today. I really believe optometrists are the frontline uh, gatekeepers and the caretakers of this very uh, unique population of patients that uh, care to call us. So we go through a number of uh, different scenarios that you face in your practice. And I will keep this very interactive since a number of you have contacted me individually. There is a lot of confusion about what to do, when, when to do surgery, when to do cross-linking, when to put the patient into contact. So we'll go through a very interactive session. So again, feel free to be uh, ready with your questions as we go through all this. And I'm gonna start with a very simple thing here. First and foremost, um, many of you, I think there are also many eye surgeons here uh, who are identified to be here, so it's a mix of population. And I would like to first start by saying, all of you do see keratoconus in your practices. Is that a yes? Okay, I'm not getting any feedback, but let's assume that. So first and important thing I like to do is break this complete scare and the complete confusion that people have on keratoconus. First of all, the minute you call it keratoconus, there is too much of fear. The doctor gets scared, the patients get scared, there's total lack of hope and that mediocrity is the outcome. So let's define keratoconus. So if you see here, keratoconus to me is nothing more than a thin, ectatic cornea with high keratometry, relatively thin pachymetry, usually with astigmatism, mostly with myopia, sometimes hyperopia, can be associated with scars and other anomalies. So if you see, if I define it in this way, I'm not calling it this horrible words, character, conus, globus, ectasia, and confusing myself. And the last thing I want you to do is sit down and do these stupid gradings from one to four to five and then get paralyzed completely and leave the patient blind. So define keratoconus as a system situation like relatively thin cornea, high keratometry, stigmatism, mostly myopia, sometimes hyperopia, can be associated with scars, other issues. Once we define it this way, you've taken this giant and you've broken it into a small dwarf which you can easily fight and win with, okay? So that's step number one. How do you look at keratoconus? Do not look at keratoconus as a disease of disaster or a cancer where all you're giving options is a transplant or a contact. There are 20 different techniques we'll go through today. Majority of my patients see 2020 without glasses. Therefore, I call this think outside the cone. So today, very important, I'm gonna change your mindset. Change your mindset and how you even look at a keratoconus patient. Don't get scared but give them hope and then even produce results. Now, I want you to look at this slide and understand these are among thousands of my keratoconus patients over three decades. Majority of them seeing 2020 without glasses. These are surgeons, these are hunters, these are uh, police officers, these are firefighters, the guys who are lifting me up. These are models, these are pilots. Uh, these are, like I said, surgeons, doctors, everybody above phase on, everybody who's come here from all over the world. Please look at these people. They do not deserve to be stuck in a contact lens or a transplant or a silly cross-linking. They deserve 2020. So if you can change your mindset, if you can only change your mindset, I'll take you to the next part of our presentation. So this is an everyday happening in my institute. This coming week, we're doing another 12 cases of keratoconus. 
all kinds of techniques from uh, fake implants to uh, lens-based cataract, uh, RLE techniques, um, cross-linking, uh, intact, correcting their Ferrara rings, you name it, and then combinations. So there is no limit. So the first thing I want you to remember is look at this slide, understand that each of these patients is seeing and they're doing amazing jobs that you, most of you think, cannot be done by a care and patient, right from pilot to surgery. Uh, I had the pleasure, as I said, as optometrists, you guys are doing a super job, especially with this new scleral contact lenses and so many modalities of treating keratoconus. Uh, one of the excellent uh, pioneers you have uh, in your side of the world is Dr. Chandrasekhar. I think highly of him, a very passionate person when he met me when I was speaking uh, uh, in Asia at that time in India. And he traveled to our institute to see some of our patients and it's really a pleasure to see him. I think he's doing a great job inspiring you guys also uh, to go forward with scleral contact and other modalities of keratoconus. So I think that's fantastic. Look at this system. This system will tell you how I think. I do not walk up to a patient with one or two surgeries in my pocket and know which one do I do for you. That's like being a burger maker, I call it. Just a burger or a hot dog. Those are two options you're giving people. You should come in as a master chef. Design it to each patient. Look at the number of techniques, technologies, and targets we can assign. We haven't even talked about combinations yet. Technology is unlimited. All of you have access to, or you have surgeons who have access to. Make sure that they are being used and designed to the patient's best interest. Lens-based technology. There are over 30 different lens options available, over 80 different lens options available all over the world that are approved. So ensure, again, that your surgeons are working in the patient's best capacity, as opposed to doing this lens and that lens, and no, I cannot do this technology because the book says this, all nonsense. Each keratoconus patient is unique. Believe the fact that they can see and perform. Now, I'd like you to see this video uh, quietly. It goes over a good three, four minutes, but I want you to see it and understand what I mean by think outside your core. Can you all see the video? Yes. I'll talk to this so we can save time as I want you to question me, leave a lot of that. Look at the number of techniques, technologies, very important here. Good, I just moved it to a hard level here. So if you look over here, I'll go through fast and keep talking. Basically, the concept here is about how we are taking technology, using it to our advantage, and then giving these patients a sight that they, even they couldn't imagine was possible. So fast forward here. Not allowing me to. So again, when you see keratoconus patients, keep your mind completely open. First of all, don't even call it a keratoconus if that gets you very scared or you start wondering what's your surgeon or doctor going to do. Tell your doctor what to do. Tell them you want this patient to see 2020 and that if they cannot perform to the level, you will come in with a scleral contact lens and make them 2020. That is the thing about keratoconus that I want to hold home today. No patient of keratoconus should not be given an option for 2020 vision. And no, not just putting a contact lens on them, surgically fix them first. So we go through this, and as you can see, for some reason in your program, I cannot fast forward the video. This is where we did the intact channel. Intacts would be Ferrara rings, the intact Gera rings, all kinds of rings that I've seen from all over the world. Doesn't matter. All I want is something to stabilize the cornea like a brace, and it flattens the cornea in the direction of a sticking film. That's very, very important. So you can vary the rings too. It's not just putting the rings in how we do it, single, double, on axis, off axis, 
using the cornea to our advantage. Not only putting the rings, and you can still do laser surgery. I do laser surface surgery, refractive surgery on keratoconus for the last three decades. Please, please, LASIK should not be done, but please don't get caught up in the silly stuff that doctors say cannot do laser. That's completely wrong. And I'll give you the other aspects of how laser is possible in keratoconus patients. And very important in these patients, big them scoring story. So you can see me doing the laser, takes about 15 to 25 microns, doesn't weaken the cornea. Of course, there are criteria that I have designed uh, in my textbook chapter that I had written on this uh, over two decades ago. So laser can be done on keratoconus, not lacing, not cutting procedures, no smiles, no blades on a cake corner cornea. Very important, please remember. You can do sutureless lamella surgery if the cornea is very bad, very thin, very ecstatic. Just put it together without a stitch, come back six months to a laser. Hand lamella for very deep cases, very important again. Don't do penetrating transplants at all for keratoconus, please. Never needed, never, absolutely never needed. Laser. So your know, surgery doesn't end until the keratoconus patient is hematrophic. Remember, I'm repeating all the time, hematropia, zero, zero, refraction zero is what you want to take on. Intraocular pachyg implants like ICL can be used in high myopia. Monofocal lens, toric lenses, uh, multifocal in a modified technique, not in keratoconus, but modified techniques I've used, piggyback lenses. Again, don't get fascinated by the lens. It's an ingredient that you use in the recipe to the best outcome. Very important. And then you can again finish with laser in these patients. Look at the reflex, perfect circle, and these are cone patients. Very important point to note, please. So any level of keratoconus or ectasia can be corrected to 2020. If not, then a residual sterile contact lens can take these patients. Do not let them go to a transplant. And I'm coming to a soft linking concept very soon now. Now I want you to see how patients react. These are patients from all over the world. Very intelligent people who had multiple surgeries on keratoconus and failed. How do you succeed? You succeed, one is by your mindset, which you make sure that these patients understand that there is an option. Two, you design as if you are aiming for 2020. So if you watch this patient too, I'm using a single intact ring and multiple keratoconus surgery on this patient. More important, see the patient's reaction as they are right under the laser not even coming out yet, right under the laser, see their reaction. That's using a glue, I don't use stitches. Hear what he says. Can you see that? He's seeing immediately, as I put the ring in, I call it a titrating impact, meaning I design it in such a way, while I'm operating, I can see the cornea reflex move. And I stop with the reflex of the perfect circle. I call that the titrate. Look at him crying. This is a tough guy, tremendously intelligent, running for commissioner. Very important, I'm showing you. These are real people and how they react to a real action that you have taken. Not giving up and saying, I'm sorry. Take them to perfect vision. Look at these patients outside. Now, I patch these patients if they had multiple surgeries before coming to me. I force the ring in, and you can see still how he says what he says. This is right after surgery. So imagine, first of all, no pain, no nothing that's deteriorating this patient's aspect with straight to vision. So very important for you, we can use laser and keratoconus. In specific cases of proper thickness, over 450, over 40 years old, stable, there's a whole criteria I have. Laser can be done. Topography is not important in laser-based surgery. The topo guided surgery is a misnomer you're correcting the topography, but not leading the patient to 2020 vision. So when you do it this way, these are patients who land straight at 2020, have stayed so for over 25 years with me. More important, if they ever change, you can always cross-link and stop them. That's the impact of cross-linking. So this is called the Golani Donaldson technique because I sit at one area and I do the intact at different, different angles to get my action the way I want. Like I said to you, the reflex has to be a circle. It can be a single yeah. double. These are patients with ectasia. Remember, keratoconus is nothing more than a coronal ectasia, right? It could be a major LASIK complication, smile complication, PRK complication, ALK complication. The fact that it's an ectatic cornea 
address that by giving a Hello. Yes, I just a minute. Ganesh sir, Ganesh Sharma, can you please, uh, can you please mute yourself? Ganesh oh. Sharma. Oh. Ganesh Sharma, Timel, uh, Tim Shina. Can you please mute yourself? Just take me. You can check it. I'll be with him. Ganesh Sharma, Tim Shina. Can you please mute yourself? Yes, yes. All right, great. Let's uh, can you... Can you do it here? Uh, that's a, that's a yes, yes, Kapil, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Ganesh, can you please mute yourself, sir? Yes, yes, I am Ganesh. Okay, sir. I speak to him, yes, sir. Okay, lovely. Yes, That's fine. Fine. Yeah. So, if you look at this ectasia case from ALK surgery, ALK was before LASIK when corneal surgeries used to be done like these. These patients went into severe ectasia. Many of these we have seen come to us. And if you see, by putting the ring in such a way that the astigmatism went straight from 10.1 to 2.7, then you do laser on top of that and bring the patient. So over here, you can see the impact of the change, 10.1 to 2.7. Even though I do not use topography to treat these patients, it's a great modality to show the outcome or the impact of change because keratoconus is a shape disorder, but shape doesn't translate to vision. Now, patients who have had intacts or Ferrara rings or Kera rings anywhere in the world are prone to me sometimes because they're very unhappy with the vision. Again, the doctors put in the ring but did not plan vision. So stopping the keratoconus is one goal, a very low goal. Taking the patients to vision is the real goal. So when these patients come to us, instead of removing their surgeon's ring, I just laser these patients in a laser corneoplasty mode. takes about four minutes. You can see the impact here, taking a stigmatism from 3.7 to 0.3, and the patients are ecstatic with their vision. Just putting the rings in can bring the posterior cornea down from 84 to 28, which is excellent. But still, you have to aim for vision. You can see the vision changing here. Patient who had a very safe or nice intact surgery, the doctors wrote great notes, intact looks beautiful. That's fine, the patient's unhappy. So bringing the patient to vision is the chart on the right here. You see why the patient is slow with their vision. Again, post LASIK ectasia, many of you may have seen LASIK ectasia, one of the most dreaded complications of LASIK surgery. Actually, it can be very easily corrected to 2020. Here you see another patient, stigmatism of 7.4 from ectasia, corrected to 0.6 diopter by using a concept of ring in such a case where you let the LASIK ectasia and the flap be where it is. Do not take these patients to transplant, please. Not a single case of keratoconus aconic to me should have a penetrating transplant unless it's fully perforated, which is extremely rare. Again, you see here how I use the concept of using rings or lenses in these patients, decrease keratometry. Remember how I defined keratoconus? It was high keratometry, thin cornea, high astigmatism, myopia, hyperopia. Put them in front of you like your goal, meaning you must get all the goals. Don't leave anything on the table. So design your surgery towards it. Don't go with the only surgery you know and then attack one and let the other three fall apart. Very important to take your patients to 2020. Again, you see this patient who came to me with Ferrara rings from Europe. His rings were broken when his surgeon threw them to me. Well, there was nothing to do here. This is beautiful. This is a great example of not jumping into surgery. The patient has a broken ring, as you can see here, but endothelium is perfect, refraction was good, other than leaving him with one diopter astigmatism. What did I do? Laser surgery, left the broken ring in. Patient not complaining about the broken ring. To go in and remove this ring from 10 years before surgery, damage the cornea, total waste of energy. You took the patient to vision. So that's a close up of that scenario, broken Ferrara. Here's a patient who was flown to me from Egypt had this procedure in, uh, in Dubai. This is a Kera ring. It goes nearly 365 degrees, if you can see a full circle. Then the doctors did transepithelial, PRK, cross-linking. 
the problem with cross-linking, which I will teach you today, so it breaks all the myths, is do not do cross-linking until the cornea is correct. If you do the cross-linking before, it's like putting the bent cornea in a bad position. So then by this time, this gentleman came to me and had all these surgeries, very poor vision. So you can see his entire family, he just flew with so much trust, brought his family over. He did his laser actually before the COVID lockdown, and he's doing super. He's waiting to fly back for his second time. So this is also important you want to understand is there are no limits to the kinds of keratoconus that present to you, whether they are bad to begin with, had a bad surgery, or had surgery, did not reap the outcome, all of them can be corrected with excellent vision optics. You can even see patients with scars and keratoconus. You can even use the rings to manipulate, in this case, the cornea. I like to move the scar from irregular to regular by using rings and shaping the cornea. And look at the topography here. It becomes a regular astigmatism that you see on your right over here. That now can be corrected with laser in this young man, despite the scar still being there. Is brought to Christmas. Now, scar manipulation I just showed you over here. Look at this seven doctor astigmatism. In this case, brought down, plus the astigmatism now looks like a perfect mustache or a bow tie, which is very regular. If this patient was over 60, I would have done a cataract surgery with toric lens with full confidence. If this patient wished this patient was a young patient, I would do laser and get that astigmatism to perfection. That's what we did. Now, even patients who had multiple surgeries. Again, remember my logic here. You're sitting as an optometrist, you're facing this patient who's had all these surgeries. The surgeon has said they've done a great job, but patient can't see anything. What do you do? Same thing again. Forget all the surgeries done. Just look at the patient. What's going on here? So when I saw this patient, I saw extreme astigmatism, irregular that also have central scarring, high keratometry, despite the intact crystal lens, ALK, lacing this patient has had. Laser this patient to a perfect vision outcome. In cases where your cornea are extremely poor, your cornea is scarred, extremely thin, less than 100 microns, keeps fluctuating, really you cannot measure in any way lamellar keratoplasty, which is a layer of cornea. I've tried to keep my surgeries away today so I can show mostly the optometrist the concepts, uh, because usually I saw surgeries in each of these steps to show, but lamellar is basically you're changing a layer of the cornea, not the entire cornea. And if you can see that, lamellar surgery like this, sutureless, looks beautiful. And you come back, this is different kinds of lamellar surgeries that I do. And mostly you get away with the top right here. Suture anterior LK, no need to do a deep surgery. Anterior, because the vision, as you know, as optometrist, you know this very well. Front vision, which is why your contact lens, sterile contact lens gives patients, patients, uh, sorry, vision, even with keratoconus or scars, because the front surface is perfected by you. Using your phenomenal concept of the front surface, that's how I do my corneoplasty surgery. The front part of the cornea is all I change. I leave everything out there, and the patients are blown away with the vision. Remember, again, the front part surgery is so easy. It takes minutes, topical, four to six minutes maximum, and the patient's back to their life with vision. Now, this is how this patient, for example, had come to us cross-linking. I want to stop here for a minute. How many of you are aware of cross-linking? Anybody? Can anyone answer? All right. Let's go. So cross-linking, I'm sure all of you, even if you're not using it in your practice or working with a doctor who has it, all of you have actually read about it, heard about it on meetings and conferences, and by now are thoroughly confused. I say this because this is the third reason people are applying to me from all over the world. The numbers are increasing over the last two years. I believe it's because of confusion. Cross-linking is a phenomenal technology. I've been involved for over, over two decades now. It got recently approved in the US a few years ago. It's been around in Asia, Europe area. Here's the problem. You don't cross-link every care of this concept of mine is called the keratoscoliosis concept. Very simple. Think of the cornea in a keratoconus as a bent spine. All of us know what scoliosis is, right? When the back, our spine is bent. Now think how silly this is. If you tell somebody whose son has keratoconus, is you're saying, Mrs. Smith, I'm a super intelligent eye surgeon. I have this new technology. I'm going to put cement on this bent back. So it doesn't bend anymore. 
Now the mother surely gets impressed. That's great, doctor. You're gonna do cross linking so the cornea doesn't get worse. But may I ask you one one question, doctor? Why wouldn't you straighten the cornea first before you cross link? Now, if you think this way, you will suddenly see clearing of all your confusions. Putting keratoconus patients into cross linking is the worst thing you can do because you have permanized their disability completely for life. Think now, if you had your son with keratoconus, he now has a bent back with cement on it, cross-linking. So he walks all his life with a bent back. Yes, you are right, he doesn't bend anymore, but you have left him bent and disabled forever. There are only two indications for cross-linking. One, a young patient below 20 who keeps on changing or is moving. Two, patient you have corrected as a surgeon to 2020. And if there is any doubt of changing, cross-link it. So you permanize your shape. Are we clear? Only two reasons to do cross-linking. One, a patient who's constantly changing and underage, below 20, meaning before the age that an eye surgeon should correct him with the 20 techniques I'm teaching. And the other indication is once you've corrected these patients, and if you doubt that they're going to change, cross-link them. There is no other indication. No other indication. Yes, you can go into publications and prophecies, and of course you could do children and all that and prevent them, but I'm talking vision, meaning before the age of 20 and after you correct them. Imagine now, having taught you this, how do you feel that every care and corners patient is being gone and gone to cross -linking? You are permanizing their disability. I'm finding it very difficult now to correct these patients because by cross-linking them, you have decreased my predictability. I'm able to hit 2020 every time I operate on them. When you cross-link them, I have some, there's some leeway of lack of predictability because now the spine, the bent cornea, doesn't behave like I want it to. Are we clear? So this is very, very important to understand. Cross-linking is an amazing technology, super technology for keratoconus. Very, very important. But when to do it is the question. Not these silly debates about on cornea, or sorry, epi, or on, and this, and this technology. Not important. You can do it with a pen light. A pen light and riboflavin drugs. It can be done. I use all these technologies I have in my institute, but I constantly like to teach surgeons the concept. Cannot get caught up with this. So I'm spending time on this because a lot of optometrists are confused because a lot of ophthalmologists are confused of cross linking. That's about cross linking. So here's a typical patient had cross linking not once, but three times with three different doctors who advertise a lot on cross linking. This patient had keratoconus. So he went and fell for a Canadian uh, in Canada, in California, in Miami, had cross-linking three times, had ICL surgery, had all these things done. Guess what was the problem with this patient? You're actually right. The chart of each of these very good doctors, the charts were very clearly written, be cross-linked, be are stable. Guess what they missed? Patient doesn't care for what you're talking about, stability and cross-linking, take on stay one patient. This patient was miserable with vision. He had astigmatism that no one even measured. So confused are doctors that the minute they see keratoconus, they assume there is no vision. And let's just put cement on this. If not, let's do transplant. If not, let's do heart contact. Is that correct? Completely wrong. Clear your mind up. Patient has come to me. Now, if you see my style, because over 80% of my practice is complications of surgeons from all over the world, I don't even look at who operated. What surgery was done? What matters is what's in front of you. I don't care how the accident happened, how many bones are broken, how are they broken, and here is my mindset. Can I make this girl with broken legs run in the Olympics? Should I repeat that, please? I don't walk up to an accident case and go, thank God you're alive. I'm giving an analogy for eyes, but same concept. So I don't walk up to that person and go, I'm sorry you have keratoconus. Let's see what we can do. And no, there's cross-linking. I'm avoiding a transplant. By the way, there's a contact. Nonsense. How do we take you to 20? So even with all his surgery, I lasered this patient and brought him straight to 2020. And that's the patient now, six years post -op. And here's another patient. Now, a lot of you, again, have, of course, cataract patients with keratin. Again, the same concept. Everybody's asking, what kind of lens do we put? Very important here again. There are 30 lens options, I told you. 
stop selling lenses. This is more for surgeons than for optometrists, but because you're managing these patients, you are facing these patients after bad outcomes. Very important to understand. The lens is just an ingredient in the vision recipe. Keratoconus cornea still is a cornea through which people can see. Don't assume that these patients should stay blind. That's the biggest fallacy that I'm going to break today for all of you. Assume that every keratoconus patient is 2020, and we all as eye doctors are failing if we do not take that care. Now, select cases I already told you we can do 2020, so that part is clear. Then another question I get a lot. If patient has been crosslinked, which is what I see all the time for these patients who come to me, that's why I told you a lot of surgeons are making this mistake. They're just crosslinking patients. Wrong. Yes, they can still be corrected with laser. The predictability is a little lower, but yes, they can still be corrected. And these are patients, just topographies I'm showing you. Now, this is how I like to correct my own patients, starting with virgin keratoconus. For example, this is a firefighter, one of the guys I showed you in my first slide who was carrying me. Uh, this is a keratoconus patient, again, told by every surgeon everywhere in the country, nothing can be done. Or we'll cross it. Nonsense. Vision. So this patient is just over 35 years of age. Firefighter has to see at night the deadly personality who needs his vision. So I measure him. Again, remember, I don't even look at the keratoconus. Corneal thickness, the stigmatism, the refractive errors, keratometries, the chemistry. I look at each element. So what did I do? I did laser. Now, because he's still young, and I felt he may change, I cross-linked them three months later. Three months after, I was convinced that I had got my 2020. In fact, in his case, 2015 vision and unaided. Look at his topography. Stigmatism is zero. So this is my own patient, how I approach them. The correct way, I call that GPS. You cannot go zigzag with keratoconus patients just because of their corners and you don't expect them to see. Here is, again, how I trap these patients. If you've done a surgery, got a great outcome, and you feel they may change cross, that's the use for cross -link. And intact can be used before, after, laser can be used before, after. So cross-linking is a tremendous technology. I've used it in every scenario. Ectatic radial keratotomy, uh, keratoconus, LASIK ectasia, smile ectasia, PRK ectasia, improper, improper lamella transplants, all but only after correcting the corner. I'll stop there. Any questions up to now? Anybody, any questions? I see on text number of people, they're just saying, yes, 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 I got it. Perfect. Wonderful. All right, so let's move on. Now I'm getting inside the eye. What if your keratoconus patient has a stable cornea but a very nearsighted, which is very common, right? A stigmatism with nearsighted. But they're very nearsighted. Over three adapters in keratoconus. Up to three, you can do laser. Again, there are various modalities I teach. Never a cutting technique. There is no such thing as thin LASIK. It's a complete fallacy. Don't cut the keratoconic cornea. These are faking implants. There are different kinds that can be used for patients with keratoconus. And the faking implant will then give them the correction of the myopia. Come back with laser and do a sting. Or put a toric idea. All those options, provided your cone is stable. Now, these are patients who are flown to me. Either the surgeon did not know before going into cataract that they had uh, what you call uh, keratoconus, or they did it even knowing keratoconus and landed with that outcome. Very easy again, very, very easy. These are patients who, what I call, are half down. We need to take them to the end zone. It's very important that way. So these are patients who've had good cataract surgery with good surgeons, but they either missed the fact that the patient had a cone, like they put in a multi-focal lens or something, or knowingly went in, but totally miscalculated the numbers, or had an anatomical difficulty. They can be corrected with all the modalities that I've talked about, straight to vision again. I have two questions here. Can you do cross-linking again, even if it's done before? Absolutely. Again, I repeat the entire confusion of on um, an epi off, an epi on, and all this stuff is okay. That's kindergarten discussion. When to do it is the real discussion that doctors are completely missing and confusing patients, right? Yes, it can be done again. Absolutely. I've done numerous cases where patients are flown to me with not one, but four and five times they've been done by same or different surgeon. They can be found here. Will all the people get 20 20 with CTR procedure in all stages? Completely wrong question, Dr. Sandhya. Completely wrong question. T3R is not a refractive surgery. It is a vision controlling surgery or a corneal stabilizing procedure. 
repeat it, what I said before. First, get the patient to vision, then cross-link. Hence, I do not like doctors mixing cross-linking with surgery. They call it silly name, basic extra, etc., whatever. Think about it for a minute. You are mixing two procedures that have different impacts on vision, like a cocktail, and praying that it works. Again, I'm relentless when I teach eye surgeons. I do not like confusion. That's why their patients have so many complications. Every patient who applies to me is an intelligent patient, but I see the complete mistakes happening from the planning. So, C3R is not a way to get to 2020. Your surgery gets to 2020, C3R stabilizes or harmonizes it, or C3R is done first to stabilize your cornea, then you do a surgery to 2020. Are we clear here, doctor, for your question? Are there any consequences during cataract surgery on patients with intact? No. Intact is in the cornea, cataracts in the lens area. Of course, your calculations have to be accurate. And more importantly, you have to prove that your lens is stable. That's very important. So you have to show that your lens is extremely stable and your cornea was stable. So you went through in these eyes and therefore you measure accurately. So anatomically speaking, surgery doesn't become any more difficult. If the surgeon is good enough, they can look beyond the reflection of the intact. The incision has to be very well done so there's no leak. Never take a stitch in the cornea. No excuse to take a stitch in the cornea. So no, no difference at all. Um, how risky is the procedure? What procedure, Dr. Belbassi? What procedure are you asking now? Can CTR be done? Next question on patient with corneal opacity. Again, again, look how your questions are wrong. Why is there a corneal opacity was my first question. What is the refraction through that opacity? What happened to that cornea? If someone cross-links an opaque cornea, they are beyond brain dead. Have you understood this now by me talking for this long to you? Cross-linking is a permanizing procedure. You don't put cement on a broken back, which is crooked. Understand what happened to the back first. Spend the energy designing what to do, then cross-link. Can it be done? Yes. Can someone jump off the fourth story of a building? Yes. Is it an intelligent thing to do? No, so no cross-linking on scar. What is the thickness of cornea you maneuver during surgery? There is no such thing. There is no such thing. Again, a complete myth, and I'm happy you asked this question. A lot of eye surgeons are confused about when to do LASIK, what's the cutoff, what's keratoconus. Think about this. Is a four and a half feet tall patient normal? Just listen to my question again. Is a four and a half feet tall patient tall or short or normal? The answer is, it's relative. Depends on your genetic composition, which part of the world you come from, and how your composition is. Are you pathologically affected by height? You get me? So it's not about how thick the cornea is. Related to the keratometry, thickness, and stability, is that cornea normal or abnormal? The bigger question is normal or abnormal. Abnormal, you don't do any cutting procedures. Normal, you can do anything you want. So thickness is relative. Yes, there is a certain thickness I need for doing my laser techniques. That's not the question. The question about thickness as a parameter is a bizarre concept and biggest reason why surgeons get into lazy cataphia. Please remember this. So the height of the person is not the way you say, hey, you're short. Wrong. If in that entire nation or culture, people are five feet tall, that's tall. But coming to, let's say, going to Holland, you're short. So that same five feet tall person is relatively different, not abnormal. Abnormal is acromegaly. A gigant is a high, a tall guy, a dwarf. So abnormal is different, height is different. How risky is CRP? There is no such thing as risky. Every procedure has a risk and benefit. Doing the on-call, on a epi on technique that I've been doing for two decades, on paper, yes, people sign their lives off, literally no risk with a CCR procedure done right. Is there any long story of surgical outcome? How likely are these stable? Doctor, I'm not one of those doctors who sits in a cave and types out papers. My patients are on Facebook. Uh, the world's most demanding patient in the world's most litigious country talking about their stories. I showed you photographs of these people. Every eye surgeon up their metal has flown here and seen the work. So white papers my fellows are producing, I don't care for them because that's bizarre, just numbers. But look at concepts here. Longitudinal, uh, for 30 years I've been doing this. Uh, nobody has ever asked me such questions, but just to answer your question, absolutely, these are all patients real people with amazing outcomes and my desire to teach eye surgeons is to make sure they stop giving mediocre work how was the ctr how can be done what's this procedure very easy please again i have lots of surgeries i've kept surgery the way just because i'm talking more concepts with you because as optometrists 
you're going to do a phenomenal job of diagnosing and managing the patient. Whether the surgeon did a right job or not is something that you have to deal with. So I'm talking about these two. What are the chances of you're in between after a procedure? Again, bizarre question. What are the chances of you getting into an accident when you drive? If you're driving on the right side of the road with the correct car and you're not drunk, most chances are you won't get into an accident. So that's my way of talking about that. Doctor, do you use oxygen during CXL? Do you perform CXL? So this is Dr. Chandrasekhar Chavan, one of your pioneers of scleral lenses. Um, in a different way than others. No. Only thing I do different, uh, Dr. Shaker, as you know me and you visited with me here and saw the patients, is I think. I think. I don't just jump and do anything. Oxygen and all these things are a lot of uh, paraphernalia around it. I've looked at the work here. A lot of patients have come with complications to me with it. It has a small impact on CXL, whatever you call it, CPR, a collagen cross-linking. It is nothing that is needed. And if it was needed, then I would be completely wrong for two decades of crossing these patients. Uh, what should prosthetic device operation be able to do? Be able to be able to about not only about the surgery. Doctor, you're asking about quality of vision. Let me correct you again. First of all, how many surgeons have you met whose keratoconus patients are 2020? 20, I'm sure your answer is zero. So understand what I'm trying to teach you. These 2020 patients don't see 2020 like a virgin LASIK patient. Okay. But the fact that you've got to take them there is the, is the point I'm trying to push you. And yes, these patients are blown away with their vision. Of course, they have visual aberrations because there's a keratoconic cornea in front of them, but give them their life back. So you cannot compare these patients of 2020 to LASIK 2020 patients or premium cataract 2020 patients who have normal cornea, correct? The point I'm trying to push to you is these patients can see 2020, strive for it. You're not guaranteeing the outcome, you're guaranteeing your desire. It's like a hurdle every eye doctor has. Keratoconus patients cannot see 2020. I've just shown you patients can see, have been seen. Let's fight for it. That's the point of today's talk. All right. What about uh, what are the minimum thickness? Again, there you go. Again, the nonsensical question. Don't pardon me. I get very tough on people when they ask these questions. What's the minimal thickness required for corneal rays? I have done it in a patient with 180 micron cornea. Now, share this with your eye surgeon so they fall off their chairs. Absolutely possible. In fact, I have kept surgeries away, but if I have time, I actually show you that patient. Think about it, guys. When a keratoconus patient comes to me, I refuse to look at how difficult they are. I refuse. All the legs are broken, the hands are broken, there's a skull fracture. I'm okay. I still want to make sure in my heart I can make him run in the open. So look at your attitude. Your attitude has to be this patient has potential. I am failing if I don't get him there. All right? So there is no such thing as thickness. If I look at the cornea and the keratometry is irregular, fluctuating, there is no scar, thin cornea, even down to 200 micron, I'm going in text. Because it's a, an access based technique of stabilizing my cornea. If it was even below 100 microns, as I mentioned to you, scarred, ectatic, I would do lamellar transplant. You see how my, my process goes? 20 different techniques. None of these surgeries I just mentioned are vision though. So once we have stabilized their cornea, I'll go in with intraocular phakic lenses or pseudo phakic lenses or extraocular lasers, cross linking, whatever I need for vision. So you see how I go. That's combination techniques. I'll show you that in a minute. All right. How to decide size or thickness of intact? Doctor, very easy question. There are no more grams I have. Uh, please go um, to my website if you want. We're uh, adding a lot of work uh, on my keratoconus. Um, uh, Dr. Kapil, the organizer of this webinar. Uh, it's also got some links. Please read my articles. They're in Ophthalmology Times. It's called Think Outside the Home. All the sizes are there. So this is what we discussed. Cross-linking, like I said, can be done in various techniques, technologies. What does GPS mean? There is an article I wrote in iWorld. I was interviewed some years ago. Uh, GPS is Bolani planning system. My point being, we must know the direction. The problem I have with a lot of surgeons who come to learn from me is they get into the car, step on the gas, get into an accident, then try to get out of it. That's wrong. You plan your destination before you get into the car and then take the best route following GPS. Same with keratoconus. Look at the big scenario. Look at your destination. Plan your system. Then decide what technique, technology. Remember my first slide, technique, technology, target. That's how I look at it. So that's to answer your question, doctor. We talked about the broken ring. We talked about how topography. Now here's, again, bizarre cases. Again, if you look at this case, look at the left side here. This is a patient with keratoconus. And you can see the pyogenic granuloma, corneal scarring, um, minus eight myopia, a minus 10 in this eye myopia, a base full of professionals. 
He went to every eye surgeon in the nation, some of the best doctors, very close friends of mine. At the top institution, he was told everywhere, transplants, even up to character prosthesis or stem cell. I mean, look at how the thought process changes. The doctors look at this, get scared, and give all these bizarre options because they think this is a debt. Let's move to some savage. When I look at him, I'm thinking, how do I get to him? So this case actually we collaborated with uh, where he goes close to with the doctor saying he performed the amniotic procedure which as you know i've written a book on now of a pterygium treated that area like a pterygium corrected it you see this as you come down the slides here over six months as the amniotic area healed this area i went in with an ic remember once he's corrected with the amniotic surgery i just have one issue i myopia i forget he has cake ones put in the ic you can see the iridectomy here. Here he is. And the other eye, we took with the ICL straight to 2020. So he's actually 2015 in both eyes. Now, can you imagine with this look when he first came that he would see 2015? He's great. Uh, I have another question. See, taking down even controlling progression of some children also was the other option. Is control. I just told you this after. Uh, CTR can be done in young kids. Yes, absolutely. To control, I said below 20. If people are changing, absolutely fine. The other, you mean the other indication, not option you're saying, to control is after you've corrected the cornea, your next question is what are other options that are available to control astigmatism? Laser is the best way to control it. Again, I told you, see how I think. You cannot ask me a single question. You can, I understand the whole logic. Let's give you scenarios, doctor, if I can help you. Dr. Harish says, what are the options he's saying after CTR to correct astigmatism? If the patient is, Less than 50 years of age, all right? Cornea is over 400 microns, and I have stability of the CCR, I will do laser surgery, laser surface surgery on the patient, straight to drive right. If the patient is over 50, I see lenticular changes, the patient is hyperopic, more than myopic, I'll do a lens exchange technique with a toric uh, lens, toric pseudopicture. If the patient is 30 to 50, high myopia with astigmatism, having control with CCR, I'll do a toric IC. You see how I'm going? No limits. No limits. Once you present the situation, give me the data. And then we nail down to what we can do. As opposed to, here is the criteria. Patient is more than 450, I will not. That's nonsense. Complete nonsense. So I hope that answers your question, Rish. Uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar Chavan, is there any age cutoff before you think of any surgery to correct KC? Absolutely. Just like in laser vision surgery, you want to make sure the patient is stable with keratoconus I wait two years old. So laser techniques I do at 18, keratoconus I wait till at least 2021, more important. I like to correspond with their optometrists and find out that the last three years, the refraction and cornea has been stable. If they are not stable, see again, Dr. Shekhar, where I'm going, I will cross-link them, then make them into a candidate for laser, ICL, cataract, whatever. Hope that answers your question. So age limit is basically proof that they are not changing more than an age limit. Here you can see again, in uh, keratoconus and PMD, uh, pedicid marginal keratoconus, ectasia, you can do beautiful cataract surgery. Doctors have now started publishing that toric lenses work. I've been doing it for 25 years. Again, the fear that most surgeons has is it won't work. All these are fears that are, have no finding. There's absolutely no roots to it. All right? So when you look at your cataract patient with keratoconus, insist that they aim for 25. I repeat, for people who are just joining, I'm seeing more people join in, is this is not a guarantee to the patient. It's a guarantee you are making to yourself. And in your case, as an optometrist, you are talking to the doctor and go, hey, doc, this patient has keratoconus, but it's stable. Obviously, right? Cataract age, 60. Most of them, there are rare cases that are still moving, but stable. Please get him to 2020. That's your request. So here's another case I'm showing you, which again, if we have time, I'll show you a video. Patient with nine surgical procedures, including hexagonal keratotomy, that left her with severe ectasia and cataract with fugues, a lot of things going on, as you can see here, nine different things. Again, I don't care. I look at the patient and go, how can I make her to To the point that she was even declared amblyopic because no surgeon ever wanted to measure her. It was horrible. A thyroid, a thyroid exothalmopathy, fugues, hexagonal keratotomy, scars, 23.5 um, after astigmatism, irregular astigmatism, a PSC cataract, high myopia, uh, uh, and uh, astigmatism, like I mentioned to you. Now, this patient, when you approach for 2020, see how the surgery is so simple, but the thought process is different. I first want to stabilize this hexagonal keratotomy cornea 
stabilized so I can control because I need the corneal measurement to measure the lens for the cataract surgery. So actually I do a very, very unique and difficult thing, but I can remember surgery should be done safely for the patient. It's very easy to do a transplant, 22 minutes, but you destroy the patient's life with that. So I put rings very carefully around the cuts, stabilize your cornea, brought the astigmatum down from 23.5 to 1.4. And then three months later, went in and did cataract surgery and with full confidence put in a toric lens to bring up the right All right? This is a great example for you to understand GPS. I have another uh, doctor here. Uh, I have a young patient having 20 20 vision. After intact, we'll have a deterioration in vision or later life. Um, what is the duration for intact in the state? There is no such thing. Intact is done with a desire for permanence. All of these surgeries are done with a desire for permanence. But, doctor, if you see any changes happening, remember what I said. It's, it's time to celebrate if you're a surgeon and you brought the patient to 20 20. But if you're seeing them change after that, have a very low tolerance to crossover. That's the time we jump and cross it because you've captured the vision, captured the cornea, and that should not change. All right, that's the answer to your question. Here's another patient, if you see, had 12 procedures before coming to me. Keratoconic patient uh, was a broadcaster, had to give up his entire profession and become a pastor. He's got corneal scar uh, from multiple PRKs, PTKs, uh, scar, he had intact surgery, he had ICL surgery, all of these surgeries done and left with 2200 vision. Miserable. Now, if you see the doctor's notes, surgery looks very good, intact looks well, ICL in place, good walk. The point all these surgeons and doctors are missing is the patient is blind. So, this surgery can get you an award at the academy. Patient is blind. So, very important again, as optometrists, what you guys do is very, very, very intelligently important in that you are stuck with this patient. You have to make them see. The surgeon has gone now playing golf. He's done. How do you make him see? So I teach surgeons to think like an optometrist. How can we bring him to 2020? So if I apply my GPS system here, I left the intact in. And what I did is I did laser first to clear the scar, make the cornea measurable. Then with full confidence, I removed the ICL and went in and put in a toric lens and got it. So, and these are patients from all over the world. These are actually a single day from all over, all different care corners, patients here from surgeons to hunters to pilots, and all of them seeing 2020. And this is the sentence they came up with. Gold stone stand alone, this kind of sound. So, I still have a lot of surgeries and stuff, but I wanted to stop here because I want to give you the opportunity to question me because uh, I've changed a lot of your concepts and I can then answer for you and go on. All right? So, Dr. Kabul, uh, if you can ask questions, then I have another one on the chat here. What's the role of contact lens in keratoconus? It's a very important role. Okay, contact lens in keratoconus, if the surgeon cannot bring 2020 to the patient for any reason, you can do that, especially with the scleral contact lens, and Dr. Shekhar talked about that. You can take these patients, nearly all of them, I think, even with scars, and bring them to close to 2020 vision. So you play a very important role. You're literally uh, actually uh, protecting the back of the eye surgeon because any mistake the surgeon makes or doesn't get to the 20 end point, you can take over and bring 20 So that's a very important role of contact lenses, yes. In cases of under, undesirable results, he tells the use of orthogonal and correct remaining might be Absolutely, this is Dr. Rania. Um, especially if the patient doesn't want another surgery. Absolutely, Dr. Rania. Yes, you can use your contact lenses if the patient doesn't want surgery. But do present it properly. Mr. Smith, I understand you had a bad cross linking with your surgeon, wherever, and I understand you're apprehensive about surgery. But I have found out there are techniques today that can make you see close to 2020. And I'm here for you as your optometrist. If your surgeon doesn't reach that, I'll fill up for that and come back and make it 2020 with my special contact. That's how your discussion has to be. A patient being scared is normal because they've been through a bad experience. If you are the head of care, you don't just say, okay, you're scared, all right, fine. That's wrong. How would you like, if, you're, if your leg was crooked and broken and someone just put a cast on it without fixing it? Correct? That's exactly my discussion. You can't say, okay, you're scared, okay, that's fine. I'll just now put you in a cast and give you a crutch for life. Wrong. Wrong. You are accepting defeat. And the patient doesn't come to you uh, with their plan. They come to you with a request. They are scared. It's your job to give them confidence that, hey, I can do something. 
So I would actually answer it in a more deeper way. Instead of saying, I know you're scared. Well, you're scared. You have to do option. Let's go this way. Because this time, I, as the optometrist, am monitoring the direction. Um, those pictures doesn't work. That's the another surgery question. Contact lenses, yes, we discussed very important role. So as an optometrist, what did we really learn today? Number one, keratoconus is not a hopeless condition. Two, keratoconus patients should not have a lifetime completely designated to crutches, heart contacts, or transplants. They do have options. When to do cross-linking, you learned today, should not be done on patients recklessly just because they're keratoconus. Land it. When we said only two indications, then you fix the cornea, do it, or when it's changing early. As optometrist, you play a tremendous role with your contact lens. You can correct the patient right after the surgical age, as Dr. Shaker discussed. You can correct the patient in the surgical age if there is no surgeon available to do it, or surgeon is not getting the results you want. And you can correct them after a bad surgery, inadequate surgery, or no surgery. You play a tremendous role in the spectrum of care. Um, thank you. Yeah, sure. You're welcome. Okay, great. Any other questions, Dr. Koppel? Uh, th uh, yes. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir, uh, sir, for such a wonderful presentation. And I'd like to request all the attendees, if you guys have any question, please unmute yourself and ask the question. And if you want to talk with the Dr. Gulani, then you can unmute yourself and ask the question. We will wait for one minute. Please have them only questions to chat or here, right here. So I guess we have answered uh, most of the question that arises in the chat box. Wonderful. Yes, I have. Uh, verbally uh, answered it, so this way everybody gets it. And again, to summarize then, for all of you, keep up your wonderful work as optometrists. You're doing a tremendous job, especially in the field of uh, keratoconus. It's important to understand that they can be corrected. It's important to understand that these are not hopeless cases or patients. Look at these faces in front of you right now. See their smiles. This is the next day of surgery. No pain, smiles. All of them have had different techniques. That's why I call it think outside the corner. Use your contact lenses to help these patients from the time early childhood till time for surgery. Help them during surgery, help them post. When you co-manage patients with your opt ophthalmologist, work with them in that. Let them know that you are there to support whatever the outcome is but make sure you insist on an outcome cannot have patients go up here upon us and be told we're going to do this so we delay your treatment that's brain death we're going to do this so we delay that's not a goal goal is can we make you safe right uh when is the right time to refer care to a patient to an optometrist to an ophthalmologist again very important you are deciding that when is the right time first of all you're managing these patients from childhood so you know many Correct? How they care about how they are progressing. I would say the minute they hit about 18 or so, get involved with an ophthalmologist. Here's why. They then can also have a history of having measured the patient with their own technology and can compare it. Remember, I said three years, two to three years. So this way, both you and the ophthalmologist can decide what is that age? That could be 20 or 21, when the patient can have options for surgery. That's when the ophthalmologist comes in and discusses with you. Then you can discuss what I've said today. Think outside the code, all these techniques. What applies to your patient? What GPS to be used? What among these 20 techniques and technology? That's when you talk to the ophthalmologist and get involved surgically because your patients in this very unique condition, Keratoconus is very unique. It's a condition where their patients know you so well, they trust you. So you get involved even during the surgery as to what's going on. And you let the surgeon know too that if it doesn't come to 2020, you're there. You can do the sterile lens, magic, make them see. So you all play a very important role. That's when you're reporting. That's when you work hand in hand. Here's the best part. After you have the eye surgery, patient's back to you for the rest of your life. So you're again monitoring and taking care of them and their family. Remember, many of these patients have brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers with keratoconus. So it's, again, a very unique specialty. But I want to give you more than hope today. It's a very bright future. We've been doing it for three decades. It's not to see a keratoconus patient and feel, oh, my God. Look at them and go, great. Just on the seminar I learned, you have options and you proceed with that. Uh, Dr. Bandari, when a patient had an early keratoconus normal tentacle to follow the patient for six months, what advice do you suggest? Again, Dr. Bandari, if you see my style, all these are 
don't even pardon my language, brain dead ways of looking after patients. Or you have a cancer, I'll see you every six months and make sure you're stable. That's stupid. All right. I understand you need to follow up six monthly, but see if any function is being impacted. If they have a liver cancer, is the function affected? Attack and take care of it. Can't tell the patient live with it till you're bad enough. Then I'm going to come and do something. Wrong. So all these six monthly follow ups are fine. But these are the same eye surgeons who spend all their time diagnosing and grading the keratoform. Have you heard that before? Grade one, grade four, grade five, irregular, thin. I'm like, shut up. Can you fix it? Fix it. So six monthly follow up with fine doctor, but please intervene. Think of it. If it was your son, how would you like a doctor to say, you have keratoconus? And after one hour of silly diagnostics, I have decided you're grade four. Your next question as a father will be, what about my son now? Because I can't do anything. It's grade four. Well, that's stupid, isn't it? If you can't do anything, why do you waste my time? And who the hell wants to know grade four? So what to do is very important. And if they say, oh, just come back every six months like that, what am I coming back for? Or to monitor. I see, but what do I do in between while my child is impacted? So if your child is less than 20, optometrist keeps them visually taken care of. More than 20, you'll find the doctor who can do these techniques, free them up. All right, so six monthly follow up is fine. I don't have any such protocol. Very important thing is fix it and then monitor that to make sure they're okay. Does that answer your question, Dr. Mandari? Uh, okay, sir. Yes, we have answered most of the question. So, All right, uh, yes, we have answered most of the, your question. If you have any question, please unmute yourself and proceed with the question. And you are welcome, guys. I'll, I've given Dr. Yes. Uh, our social media handles because our YouTube has all the surgeries, all my techniques, our uh, website and everything. You can follow me. Try my best to keep in touch with y'all. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, for such a wonderful presentation. So I guess uh, we have answered the most of the question. And considering the time limits here, I announced the closure of the discussion. Before ending the today's session, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude towards the presenter, Dr. Arun Gulani, sir, and all the attendees. And also, I'd like to appreciate all the helping hands for the ITUX program. Here with, I am ending the today's session, requesting all you please uh, provide your review and feedback. And sir, if you have any good messages or in notes to provide to this platform. Surely. First of all, thank you for having me, doctor. I had to actually stop doing webinars because of the time it was taking with all the surgeons. But uh, I think this was excellent, your persistence. And I truly believe optometrists do a fantastic job. And you are the guys who are really taking care of these patients on the front line. So starting today, I don't want you to let any care of this patient go to ordinary vision. Please fight for their vision. Uh, Dr. Kapil, again, thank you. And thank the Nepal Society. Also, just for your knowledge, that Nepal is very close to my heart. That's where I had my honeymoon. So I love the place. And uh, please keep up your wonderful work. Any questions, I'll make sure to personally answer. All right? Have a wonderful week and rest of you.